Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Craig Lee. Um, we're still waiting for Dave Chadwick to show up, but um, until he does, I'm going to go ahead and get started, and I'll, I'll do the best that I can talking to his slides as well. Um, in, in his inimitable way, um, you know, he, he took the briefing and he stuck in a whole bunch of new slides at the last minute uh, and whatnot to try and, and get across the, the notion of uh, uh, you know, attribute mapping and those kinds of things that we're going to be talking about with regards to uh, you know, managing federated authorization um, in, you know, across different clouds. Uh, so I come from a place called the Aerospace Corporation. Um, that is a nonprofit, federally funded research and development uh, corporation. And David Chadwick, who is just coming in right now, is a professor at the University of Kent. So uh, while he's getting mic'd up, I'll just go ahead and charge into the, um, the, the talk. So um, you know, the challenge here and why we were thinking about all this stuff is because um, you know, we had some use cases. Or, and I had one specific project where I needed to securely manage resource sharing you know, across different sites. You know, it's this dynamic IT environment where you know, these collaborating organizations could come and go sort of on demand. Okay, so uh, I'm going to show some use case drivers that, you know, that show you why that's important. And specifically, the first one, the uh, disaster response, um, you know, I just finished up a funded project where we you know, implemented VOs, did a very uh, quick and dirty uh, proof of concept demonstration for being able to use virtual organizations to manage uh, container access in Swift. Okay, but that same kind of way of managing data access in other contexts are also applicable to, um, to you know, GIOS and also you know, feature film production. I'll talk a little bit more about that. So um, what this really requires, you know, how to address this is the first step is the you know, federated identity management capability um, that uh, David has been working on. And if you're following the Keystone project, um, you know, he's actually had a lot of input about how they're actually going to manage uh, federated identity management and how to manage the attribute mapping, given that you, know, you have an identity from some other identity provider, um, and how do you map those identity attributes to what you can understand locally, given that you could have different users coming from different sources that have different uh, identity providers. Um, and so related to that is that once you establish identity in the local context, okay, a VO is sort of like a security and collaboration context that's not exclusively associated with any one, any one particular organization. And so again, the, the notion there is that um, you know, once you become a member or, of a VO, you have a, another set of identity attributes or authorization attributes that are, are given to you that allow you to do certain things, you know, gives you uh, specific capabilities or authorizations within the context of that VO. And so we'll, we'll go through how all this is, is, um, is supposed to work. Okay, so we're going to go through just a few examples. Um, this is the disaster response um, uh, scenario that we went through. So um, the NGA and the NCOAC, which is a, a network centric operations industry consortium, so it's another nonprofit organization, wanted to demonstrate this thing that they called a GeoInt community cloud prototype for disaster response. And what motivated this is, uh, you know, the Haiti earthquake back in 2010, you know, all these government agencies, you know, they, they couldn't figure out you know, who had what material or where material actually needed to go. They had very limited um, knowledge of, of how to get material into uh, you know, Haiti. So the idea is that they wanted to, to have this capability where they could share data on demand among uh, different government organizations, different non-governmental organizations, uh, also get data from you know, the people that were on the ground, you know, they had mobile devices. So the idea is that you, know, you have any number of these stakeholders. Um, you know, which could include, you know, people that have satellite imagery. You know, you can compare before and after to see where, uh, where you know, uh, uh, civic damage has taken place or where uh, earthquakes or tsunamis, you know, all that kind of stuff to, to get an idea of, of where damage has occurred. And also um, uh, things from uh, terrestrial sources, uh, you know, civic information like, you know, engineering blueprints or whatnot, and then also, uh, you know, people in the field. And you, you know, either populate that on a map or you have some sort of way of sharing this information dynamically between these different stakeholders um, you know, that have different infrastructures and different rules for how to share information uh, and be able to do that on demand. Okay, Because you don't know when an earthquake is, uh, is going to strike or who might need to be involved in that kind of uh, you know, disaster response uh, scenario. Uh, another example that I can come up with is this um, Global Earth Observation System of Systems, or GEOS. This is a very large international project 
they have like this 10-year plan of how to build out this infrastructure for sharing um, you know, geospatial information, uh, you know, Earth observation um, data across all the different members, you know, Asia, you know, Europe, the North and South America, and so forth. And um, again, they have this set of nine uh, societal benefits that they actually want to demonstrate. And of course, disaster response is one of them, but there's also, you know, climate change, water, uh, you know, you can read them all here, but, the, you know, those are the kinds of, um, uh, you know, motivating factors for being able to manage the sharing of data. Um, another one uh, that is actually quite interesting is this notion of, um, you know, cloud-based feature film production. And um, there's actually this, uh, another small uh, nonprofit called the Entertainment Technology Council that's hosted at the University of Southern California. And uh, what this is, is it's a consortium of uh, the technology providers like Amazon and Google, but it's also the feature film producers like you know, Warner Brothers and Disney and, and so forth. And they're all trying to figure out how to adopt technology to do feature film production. Of course, you know, it's a business and they have to think about, you know, budget and, and um, you know, doing things uh, effectively. But the, the notion here is that a lot of films that are produced today are, you know, completely digital. Even if they're not, uh, you know, just action sci-fi films, that, that, you know, they will have a lot of um, uh, effects that are done uh, in post-production, in just, you know, digital format. So in a film production, you have a lot of different uh, uh, production houses that would participate in actually taking the, you know, uh, you know raw data assets and producing the, the, you know, the feature film. And so using a virtual org organization could actually be used to manage, you know, which production houses get access to which data assets in which order to produce this final film. And of course, when, once it's done, you know, you revoke everybody's, you know, uh, you know access for, for those data assets and away you go. So th again, this is another instance of um, being able to dynamically manage the sharing of data across different organizations. Okay. So um, that's interesting. There we go. Okay. Uh, now, so this is probably where I'm going to let David take over because we're going to talk about the, the initial uh, technical capabilities that we need for doing this. And that starts with uh, this notion of federated identity management. Yeah, I mean, the, the common feature in all of these is that all these multitude of partners, they already have their login IDs. They already know how to log into their own system. But logging into multiple systems, you don't want to be giving people new sets of credentials every time. So the concept of federated identity management is you use your existing credentials to log into the, all these new systems that are dynamically created. So that's it. Now, in order to do that, you need to have three things from the service provider's perspective. If I'm now no longer going to be giving out credentials to my users, where am I going to get those credentials from? And the answer is I have to trust other entities to do it. And I have to trust other entities to authenticate the users. And I have to trust other entities to give the identity attributes of users. And then I'm going to do the authorization myself. I'm, st I'm still not going to trust other people, although there are models where we can also give out, delegate trust in the decision making as well. And there are models where you can actually have external PDPs that will make the trust decision for you. And then you don't do anything yourself. You just farm the whole of the security decision, decision making out. Now, the thing is, when you've got these dynamic organizations and you're now going to use your own credentials with your own organization to log into these other service providers, you need different attributes to give you different permissions at these different places. But if you go back to your organization and say, I want you to add me, member of VOX, into your corporate LDAP service, what are they going to say to you? They're going to say, on your bike, right? There's no way that your organization is going to start adding attributes into its back-end systems so that you can log on to these remote systems. And that's where the VO concept comes in. We need to have, we need to have some other mechanism to do that, OK? Um, now, the trust, as I said, is indispensable. And when we build federated uh, management, one of the important things is to uh, add the trust in. We've done that in our federated uh, keystone. We have these three levels of trust which we can configure in. Um, and I said the problem is we can't get the IDPs to assert the attributes that we need, so we need the virtual organization. 
So this VO then is this security context. It's someone who is in charge of the VO who's going to actually give out the attributes to you and all the other members of the VO. So there'll be lots of these VO managers for all the VOs that you're a member of who'll be giving you attributes. And now we've got the problem which is sometimes known as attribute aggregation. How do I get the attributes from your IDP that's logged you in and from the virtual organization manager who said what your, what your role is in the virtual organization, ag aggregate these attributes together in order to give you authorization on the particular service provider. So that's, that's the particular, particular issue. And, and there are a couple of ways. Um, actually, there's, there's another example to say, this is not a new idea, OK? It actually originated from the grid world. So virtual organizations as a concept have been around for, I would guess, eight years? More than 10. Oh, more, more than 10, more OK. Than 10. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and they already have a well worked out infrastructure, which they call VOMS. VOMS is the virtual organization management system. And they set it up. It actually has a back end LDAP. Uh, and they run it as a separate service. Uh, and the VO managers will add the attributes for the people in the VOs in it. But then they have this problem of attribute aggregation. So it's not a new concept. So we were looking at how can we put VOs into clouds once we bring clouds in. And what's the, what's the different granularity between federations and clouds? Because the grid world didn't have the concept of uh, a federation as such. In the grid world, you had a PKI. And everybody had PKI certificates, and you use your PKI certificate to log in. But federation is, 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 is somewhat different to that. Now, what's the, what's the granularity between these? Well, a federation can have many VOs. So in, in the UK, we have the UK Academic Federation. It's got 100 universities uh, that are joined in. It's got multiple service providers. There are actually over 800 partners in this federation. You can imagine there can be thousands of VOs within a concept, with a, within a system like that, where a couple of universities and service providers get together. So that's one common scenario. But another scenario is you might actually set up a, ve a federation of VO, which is actually the same, and the, the, the same people organize it, and the VO is the federation. You could have that. But thinking further, you can actually have a VO that can span multiple federations. Um, so within, within, again, the academic community, which I'm familiar with, we have the federation in the UK. There's the federation in, in, in America. There's federation in Norway. There's federation in, uh, in France. These are now actually being spanned together uh, through the giant project. In, into a federation known as Edugain, where they're linking all these different federations together. And then you can imagine that a VO can actually span multiple federations. So we could actually have a, we could have a VO which can comprise of people from an American university, people from a Belgium university, and people from a UK university, and a service provider maybe in Greece or something like that. So they're, they're, they're separate concepts in, in, in terms of domains, and, and they're not limited. So you're not, you're not necessarily limited in, in the span of a VO. Now, when we came to doing it in, in OpenStack, we, we looked at it from a different perspective. Craig looked at it as a perspective from, OK, VOMS exists in the grid world. How can we utilize that? So, so actually, the, way, the perspective that I took is, what's the simplest, quickest, <laughs> yeah. quick and dirty thing that I can just demonstrate a prototype capability? And so that's why the, this notion of having an external VOMS where you have all the VO uh, state in, in one centralized place is obviously the, the easiest way to implement this. Um, but the, the notion of um, uh, having you know, the VO information replicated across the different keystones is obviously another approach. Because there's a database on, on the back of the VOMs where you store this information. So you could either have a centralized database or you could have a distributed database where the VO information is replicated. And of course, that brings in all the traditional uh, you know, replication and consistency issues. But, I mean, depending on your situation, you know, there's two, those are two different viable approaches. Yeah. I mean, I mean, my viewpoint was I didn't want to baggage the people who are running OpenStack with the VOMS infrastructure. I wanted to actually say, well, can we get away from running VOMS? And can we actually do VO management actually within Keystone? So that's what we were looking at, doing the VO management yeah. actually within Keystone. Because you're already running Keystone and OpenStack. So can we actually do away with not having VOMS? OK, so um, I'm going to describe a little bit about you know, what we actually did for this uh, GeoInt Community Cloud uh, prototype. And this is just an example of how it might work to you know, give people the idea. I, I'm going to go through some stuff that is a little bit more you know, anatomically correct. But um, obviously, you have you know, some number of uh, OpenStack clouds there with Keystone and Swift. 
Okay, the, the first capability that we're, we were um, getting towards is, is how to manage access to Swift containers, because Swift, have, Swift containers have ACLs on them, and so um, that's going to work into this. So obviously, you know, what happens is that um, we modified the keystone such that when you uh, log into a VO uh, project, the keystone knows to consult this external VOMS, which you know, has the database in it. And uh, if you do a successful VO login, then you know, that user up there on the upper, upper left, when they actually um, uh, you know, make a, a request to Swift, they automatically get uh, authorized to access all those other containers that are being contributed or you know, are part of this distributed virtual organization. Now, the user up there, they're just logging in with their regular credentials. They know that they're a, a member of this VO, but in terms of the authorization process that goes on underneath, you know, they don't know anything about that. All they know is that they get back a list of containers um, you know, from the list operation that they can subsequently do you know, upload and download operations on. OK. So um, in terms of um, when Keystone knows to do a VO login, what we did is we added this VO auth stage to the command pipeline. And again, this is a very simple way of doing it, but um, we extended the Keystone project concept to a VO project by just putting a capital VO dot prefix on it. So if your project name is VO dot, you know, Keystone knows, OK, I have to go consult the VOMs and you know, see if this uh, user is a member. And if, if they are, then they actually get mapped to a role account that's part of that VO. And also, there's a number of sites that are, are recorded that are participating in that particular VO. So um, David wanted to make some more comments about uh, this notion so, so, of attribute so, mapping. Yeah, so, so th this, this now is, is using an approach where you don't use an external VOMs, but you actually use your existing Keystone. So this is an example of two users um, from different domains, different IDPs, could be a user from Kent, could be a user from Aerospace, um, and we've got a common VO uh, where we're using some OpenStack service. And how can we actually guarantee that we can both access the same resources because we're members of the same virtual organization? So what we've added into Keystone is an attribute mapping functionality which takes the identity attributes which come from the IDP and we map them into the same domain project and roles so that two different people from two different organizations who have got different sets of attributes which are coming from their IDPs, nevertheless, using the mapping functionality, they end up getting the same permissions in OpenStack. So they become essentially members of the same group or members of the same virtual organization. So that's the approach that we took in ours so that you would, you would manage it by not managing an external VOMS and saying this user has this group and then it gets sucked into the pipeline as in, in Craig's model, but you manage it by saying this user is a, is, has this project uh, domain, et cetera. So that was, that's the approach that we took. And, and both of them, we've shown, both of them can work. Um, moving on to, oh, sorry. OK, so the actual attribute mapping that we do is, uh, is it's rather complex. It's based on sets, and it's mapping sets of sets. But by mapping sets of attributes to sets of attributes, you just get the most generic uh, form of mapping possible. Uh, because in the simple case, a set consists of one attribute, and you map one attribute into one. But of course, you can do one to many, and you can do many to one. So we, we made it sets to sets just to give us the most uh, generic uh, capability. Now, the, what if you've got, as in Craig's case, multiple keystones and multiple service providers? You either have to repeat the mappings in each keystone, uh, and that's what you talk about peer-to-peer -peer and replication, et cetera. Or if you devise an attribute mapping API, which is externally callable, you, you would only need to set it up in one keystone, and then any external keystone will be able to call the attribute mapping function and say, I've got this user with this set of identity attributes, okay, coming in, give me the attributes that they map into, and then that external keystone can also use that mapping. Okay? 
So in that, way, in that way, you could actually use the same mapping functionality by multiple cloud services. And in fact, why you could go further, you could actually turn attribute mapping into a separate OpenStack service. So effectively, you're creating a VOMS as a cloud service. So you now have your VOMS as a cloud, as a cloud service, and then anybody can actually make use of it. So that would be taking the, the mapping functionality, extending it further. Now, there are multiple ways you can do user authentication. Uh, in, in Craig's way, they use their existing Keystone authentication. The grid way is to use external PKI, and they're authenticating users using PKI, and then you can use federated authentication. We need, when we do virtual organizations, to support all three. We, we don't want to limit ourselves to just one. We have to have a mechanism that can support all three ways of user authentication. So that, that's an important thing to bear in mind. Okay, um, I think this is back to y'all. Yeah, yeah, so uh, just to give you another example of you know, how this worked in, in what we did for the GeoInt Community Cloud. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, we have these two different clouds here. And you know, we have this external VOMS, you know, which is you know, just implemented as a simple you know, MongoDB. Um, so what happens first is that when the user requests a, a, a Swift operation, you know, the Keystone client will authenticate with Keystone. And the Keystone, since this is a VO project that the user is, is logging into, when they, you know, when they, get that, when they want to get that scoped token, the Keystone will actually go off to the VOMS. The VOMS will uh, authenticate them as, as a member of that VO. And what happens is that they actually get authenticated as a role, as a role account. So the user gets mapped to this role account, and then what the one keystone will do is it takes the list of all the other participating sites, and it actually logs into all of the other keystones using that role account, and ultimately, you know, if all that goes successfully, returns all that information back up to the Swift client. So that means that after the successful login, the successful VO login, you know, they have all the service catalogs in an auth token for all the sites that they're authorized to talk to as part of this VO. Okay, now, when we actually talk about container access, um, the Swift client will uh, do a list or an upload or uh, you know, download operation. And obviously what happens is that, you know, depending on what they do, you, know, you just have this you know, typical uh, sequence of operations, but uh, the user at cloud A can access you know, whatever containers on their local cloud that, they, that they're on, you know, read or write ACL for, but they also have all the authorizations to go off to these other clouds um, you know, based on uh, their authorization. So you know, we just had to add an extra uh, you know, argument to uh, you know, the Swift command line um, uh, tool uh, to be able to specify you know, which cloud that you want to go to based on your authorizations within, within the VO. But the user you know, doesn't know anything about how they were actually authorized. You know, the, the role accounts and you know, the, the passwords that are used for them are uh, uh, you know, not known to the users. And this was just simply you know, the simplest way of demonstrating this um, you know, for our customers in, in the US government, uh, as opposed to having to do a full up uh, you know, PKI implementation or, or actually getting to the point where we could integrate the attribute mapping that, um, you know, that David had been working on. Okay, and then also, um, you know, the, the local admins at each site, um, you know, they have control over the ACLs on the storage container. So, you know, each site, each local admin retains control over how they're actually making their data assets, their containers available to the different roles within the VO. So that's important that the local admins, you know, local site retains complete control over their data assets. They can grant or revoke access, uh, you know, at any time. And the way that this is, was used in the a disaster response scenario is, you know, on the left, you have all your different members from all your different sites or whatnot. And what the VOMS does is it maps them into specific roles, like something like, you know, medical staff or civic engineers or people that are first responders. And then at each participating site, the local admin will put those roles on the different ACLs for the different containers that they want to make available within the entire, you know, disaster response effort. Um, so that's you know, basically the model that we use just to demonstrate this VO uh, concept um, within you know, something like you know, federated OpenStax. So um, uh, the, the biggest lesson that I had from this is that uh, you know, we actually need to support 
other uh, methods of data access beyond just simply uh, storage containers. I mean, doing it for storage containers is certainly useful, but uh, you know, the Boeing guys came to me and said, well, gee, this is great, but can we use the VOs to manage access to databases? And I said, well, no. Uh, the Telos guys came to me and said, this is great, but can we do it to uh, manage RSS feeds? Because you know, all of our disaster management uh, uh, tools that we built are built on uh, RSS feeds. So uh, you know, it got me thinking, and the issue is, well, how can we use VOs to manage access to arbitrary <coughs> application level services? So one possible way of doing this is that uh, you have some sort of application service owner. And what they do is that they build their application um, and they have this VO PEP, policy enforcement point, that they put in front of their service. And they instantiate that as, as a machine image. Okay. Once they do that, they can register that endpoint with the Keystone service catalog. And of course, this is all just um, you know, quick and dirty. We're piggybacking on the Keystone service catalog in you know, some operational sense, you, know, you might not want to ever do that, but it certainly works for uh, demonstration purposes. But um, So at that point, you know, the Keystone has the endpoint and also whatever required VO roles or attributes that you want to associate with access to that particular application level service. Okay, so later on, when a user wants to use that service, you know, they do the typical thing of authenticating to Keystone. Um, uh, Keystone asks the VOMs, they get mapped into their um, uh, uh, their VO role, and um, so Keystone will return, what Keystone will do is it will return you know, the auth token and also the service catalog, but it will also have the appropriate uh, application service endpoints that that particular user is authorized to use within the context of that VO. So you know, there could be scads of different application level services in that particular catalog, but the user only gets to know about the ones that they can actually use. Okay, and so uh, then when the user actually uses that, uh, that endpoint, the, you know, the uh, VOPEP, you know, authorized with Keystone, they get the authorization, authorization back, and then finally the, you know, the call completes. But, um, you know, so this would be one way of at least demonstrating how things like database access or, um, uh, or RSS feeds could be managed using the VO concept. Um, there's also this um, capability called geosynchronization. In the uh, geospatial world, uh, there's this notion of, well, you have all these data producers that are producing maps and uh, features on maps, and they want to um, push all this data to people that already have maps. So it's, it's called this geosynchronization. Um, and all of that is based on RSS feeds. So you know, we're hoping that we can demonstrate this in the context of the standardized geospatial function called geo, uh, geosynchronization where you know, whoever, the only, only the people within a VO you know, actually get the right data at the right time. Okay, so um, there's certainly a number of important but ancillary issues um, around VOs. One is you know, how do you, you know, create and terminate a, a VO? How do you join or leave a VO? Uh, who gets to be the VO admin? Who gets to be the VOMS administrator? Um, and just you know, the semantic interoperability of, of VOMS, uh, you know, what do the resources, roles, and attributes mean? Uh, you know, how do you do data publishing and discru uh, discovery? It's this um, you know, inherent semantic interoperability problem. Um, for people that are actually using this, the granularity of resource protection will be an issue. What we demonstrated with Swift containers is just um, yeah, access at the container level. What if you wanted to do it at the object level or you know, at something smaller? At some point, the granularity of, of access is going to become an issue. Uh, it's, there's going to be a trade-off point where um, you know, you're, you're not just, it's just going to be too much overhead to uh, protect uh, small grain data. Uh, there's also this notion of, of trust federations. In the, in the grid world, there's this thing called the International Grid Trust Federation. And that's this human organization whereby they specify how all these PKI um, certificate authorities are supposed to be operated. And once you demonstrate that you're doing things correctly, you get the stamp of approval, and everybody else trusts your certificates. Um, the same kind of thing could be done in something like a disaster response scenario, where there's some international disaster response trust federation. And that's where all these uh, agreements that need to be hammered out ahead of need you know, could be done in terms of you know, what do the roles mean, how do you authenticate certificates, um, or or how do you manage credential, um, uh, different credentials that have different attributes from different sources? And of course, that's where the federated identity uh, issue comes in. Okay, so um, 
Those are sort of ancillary issues. Uh, there's also a number of key design issues for views and OpenStack. So, um, you know, we did this very basic, you know, prototype just to demonstrate the issue. And part of it is, well, okay, just using that as a driver to understand the design space for virtual organizations. Um, if, um, if it hasn't become clear yet or not, you know, the notion in, in OpenStack is that, well, we took the project concept and we added this other property to it such that, you know, uh, you know, we actually could be calling this virtual projects or distributed projects. So the question becomes, well, you know, what's the right abstraction to present to the user for managing these collaborations across sites that need to be dynamic in nature? You know, they can come and go. Uh, you can uh, grant, you know, grant or revoke authorization. Okay. So uh, how to store the VO attributes? Um, you know, do we want to have, you know, separate user entries with the, you know, the VO attributes or having these general mapping uh, role, uh, rules? Uh, how to integrate VOs from multiple clouds? Can I, can I clouds? just come, come in on, on, that, on that first point? Yeah, because sure. I think there's, there's an interesting thing in scalability here because with the, with the VOMS concept, you, you have one entry per user, which is fine for small VOs, but if you've got VOs of you know, hundreds of thousands of users, mm -hmm. you have to have a VOMS with hundreds of thousands of entries. If you go for the general mapping rules, you need one rule per class of, class of mm -hmm. user. And if you have whole groups of users that are in the same class, for example, everybody from this department in this organization, you only need one rule. You need one entry to cover that entire class. So there, there is you know, difference in scalability there that if you go for the general mapping, in the worst case, you'd have one mapping rule per user to map the user's attributes into the VO ones. But if you've got a whole bunch of users that have got the same identity attributes, then you only need one rule to map a whole bunch of things, and you end up with a smaller thing to manage. Yes, and, and that's, that's actually exactly. the, the scalability um, yeah, bullet that's down there at the, the, at the bottom issue is that. There. Uh, out of all these things, um, yeah, the, the scalability of the implementations are going to yeah. be important you know, once we actually start running these in, any, in, any particular, uh, in a particular size. Um, okay, again, the, the notion of um, an external uh, VOMS database as opposed to this peer-to-peer -peer keystone database, um, typical thing. It centralizes easier to, um, to implement. Uh, it's also easier to do a revocation of authorizations if you have everything in one point, in, in one place. Um, if you go to a, with a peer-to-peer -peer approach, uh, you don't have to rely on this third-party VOMS. It's not a single point of failure, uh, but it does introduce the, you know, the issues of having to do replication of data and, and consistency. Um, uh, whether the check whether a user is a member of a, uh, of a VO or not, I mean, that has a particular overhead to it. Do you want to have to check that every time, or is there some way of only checking that when you need to? I mean, again, if, if, it's, if you're using the peer-to-peer -peer internal approach, the overhead of doing a, a quick lookup on a mapping table is not so big. But if you're making a call out to an external VO service that's running in some external system, you don't want to be making call outs to that for people who are not actually part of the VO because that would actually put a lot of overhead into, into, the, actual, uh, into the actual logging process of the user. So. Right, right. Um, and then as we mentioned all, uh, already that this, this notion of using VOs for arbitrary application level services. So um, I mentioned databases and RSS feeds. Um, there's, you know, there's other standard geospatial tools like web map server, web feature server, uh, these kinds of things that you know, we might be able to look at. There's a, another project that I'm starting on that uh, you know, might, might be able to use these things. Um, also this notion of what should be at the application level as opposed to what should be at the infrastructure level. Okay. Um, what should be in Keystone and, and what should stay you know, perhaps up at the clients or actually in the application. Um, you know, that's another issue. I, you know, we're running out a little bit out of time here, so I don't want to go into uh, excruciating depth. Uh, who manages the VO? Again, uh, are the administrators distributed or is there someone centralized? Um, I, again, I keep on hammering at the thing of infrastructure level federation versus application level federation. Um, you know, we can talk about federating, um, you know, containers or even federating um, you know, novas that if you're in one, one virtual organization, you know, can you, are, can you get authorized to spin up uh, images at different, um, at different sites? You, you, or if you, you just you know, request a, an image to be spun up locally, but somehow Nova knows how to schedule it over there if it determines that's the better thing to do. And of course, scalability is important for all these, all these issues. And I think um, uh, this is the last slide that I think that we have. So uh, 
David's described the attribute mapping in Keystone, and if you're following the Keystone project, I mean, that is a, a, a significant con contribution, I think, to, uh, to the direction of Keystone being able to support federation. Um, you know, we've got this, Aerospace has this external VOMS. It's a very simple Im implementation, but the value of it is that, you know, certainly has driven our understanding of the entire VO uh, uh, design space. And the question is, you know, uh, as, a, as a community, how would we want to pick, you know, we, where we put our resources further? What are the drivers that people are actually going to need, um, you know, for these things? Um, also, um, the, the European grid infrastructure, EGI, they also have a group that has an initial OpenStack um, uh, VO implementation. Uh, they actually can piggyback on their existing PKI infrastructure where, um, you know, when you log into a VO, uh, you actually get a proxy certificate that has your VO attributes in it, and, and that's how they manage these VOs. Um, you know, currently, um, you know, they, you know they, they don't actually have any roles or or things like that within their concept of VO. If you're a member of a VO, you get access to everything within that VO. But um, you know, I'm sure they're going to be building out these capabilities in, in the not too distant future. You know, I talked to them last in September, so uh, they're probably working away on that. And then this um, uh, Open Geospatial Consortium Open Mobility Testbed Project is, uh, you know, just got kicked off um, uh, recently, and, and that's where I'm hoping to be able to use uh, you know, the, the VOMS notion to manage access to. Uh, geospatial data in a standardized way um, by, by managing access to what are essentially these application level services. So with that, um, Dave, yeah, is there any other comments you'd like to make? No, I think it's any questions really. If we've got time for a none, <laughs> one, two. Yes. I'm sorry, could you speak? Well, well the fe we're not talking about any federation. We're talking about federation as a generic concept. So when you install your Keystone, you actually configure in the federation that you want it to be part of. So th there are multiple federations existing in the world today. Um, you can make your Keystone service part of that federation by contacting the federation provider and saying this is a new service to add to your federation. Okay, so do you mean that they have uh, clinical Sorry? Do you mean that they have clinical Yeah. Well? Yeah, yeah. We're, our, our code is it's actually part, it's actually, you can actually download our code, but it's not part of the core Keystone. It will be in the next release of Keystone, there's going to be, federation is going to be part of the core release of Keystone for Ice House. So what, what we've been doing this week at the Design Summit is just scoping how much of the, the stuff that we've done, which is all additional and you have to add in yourself, will be core. But certainly, over the, you can see over the next two releases or so, full federation will be will becoming part of the, uh, of the core release of uh, Keystone. Yeah. At the moment, you have, to take, you have to take the Havana release and you have to take our stuff and, and plug it in. It's, uh, it's actually in GitHub over under the name of my developer. So I can give you the URL if you contact me. Yeah. It's Christy. It's GitHub something something slash Christy. <laughs> <laughs> she just created it with her own name when she created the, 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 the store. Okay. Oh, yes? I, I used to work with VOMS people when I worked in the grid world about five years ago. Um, people from, from GAR, actually, um, but, uh, but not in the last few years. In fact, I, I, I thought that VOMS had more or less stopped its development, but maybe I'm wrong there. No, no, uh, we are from my understanding, so we can keep in touch with them. Right. Yeah, yeah well, I was in touch. So, yeah. yeah, I was in touch with those people. We, we, yeah. we used to go to the OGF, because we both used to go to the OGF, and we were in contact with them then. Yeah, and, and I was at the EGI Technical Forum you know, in, in September and, and talked to the, the folks that were doing the, you know, the VO work, work right now. Um, and actually, um, one, one, one last comment before this, but um, when I started this project, 
you know, I was going to do all this stuff. I was going to take David's stuff and put that in the front, and I was going to use this VOMS at the Texas Tech University that's part of um, you know, the open science grid and, and do all this stuff. But as we got into the project, it, like, it got descoped smaller and smaller and smaller till all that we, you know, the really core thing was just putting the extra stage in the Keystone pipeline and then being able to manage access to the storage containers um, you know, in a very specific way, just based on the notion of you know, you know, mapping a uh, user's identity to their role account. And uh, you know, just being able to demonstrate that actually you know, sort of got the idea across to a lot of folks. Um, you know, the, the demonstration went quite well. Then there was the US government shutdown and blah, 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 blah. But, um, but I mean, you find that actually, when you talk to most people in OpenStack, they've not heard of VOMS anyway. Yeah, yeah they don't. <laughs> Yeah, but, but, but most of them don't know about VOMS, so that, that's why I came from the approach of, okay, ignore VOMS, let's see if we can build it into OpenStack without actually needing to invoke yeah. all the VOMS infrastructure. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I can speak offline too, but uh, yeah. have you looked at uh, what abstractions uh, can be used to uh, represent these uh, agreements and policies that can exist between traditions of uh, cloud providers? Uh, yes, we're going uh, oh, yeah. to we're gonna have to go and take, <laughs> talk outside. Yeah.